Christopher Nolan. He's one of the most talked about filmmakers our time has. There is something that has always fascinated me about filmmakers is that they particularly have subtleties and finer details in their films that they carry throughout their careers. I don't know where he got it. I mean, it probably wasn't even his. In, in Holland. I don't know how else to it. And today I'm going to look at some of the things I've noticed that really always appear in Nolan's films. Christopher Nolan was born and partially raised in London. Growing up, he cited 2001 A Space Odyssey as an influence. In his 20s, while studying English literature at UCL, he began experimenting with 16mm film in order to create surreal films, one such doodlebug, a short Kafkaesque film which used quite groundbreaking techniques for its time and considering what budget Nolan was probably working with. This already proved that Nolan had a different way of telling stories. Moving on to his first feature following, Nolan really got to implement the idea of time as a device. For instance, at the beginning of following, notice how the camera is very steady, and so is the editing structure, very linear. And just like that, in a single cut, Nolan thrusts us into a completely different time zone. In this case, he sends us to the past. One thing you'll also notice about following is after the opening scene, the film becomes more haphazard with handheld camera movement and jump cuts. It's not so steady anymore. Though this was done for budgetary reasons as explained here. If we shoot black and white film stock so that we can get a bit of an expression of style cheaply and quickly, um, if we do it predominantly handheld camera, so we're not trying to ape larger movie making techniques with the dolly and so forth and, and things that actually require very expensive equipment. What is the most resilient parasite? Bacteria? A virus? In Inception, just like following, we open with an interior scene which is in the future time period. But in a single cut, we're in the past and within the same room. Nolan has saved us minutes of exploratory footage and montages in a single cut to take us to a separate time. Let's go back a few years. In Memento, color is used to place us into two different time periods. Present moments are in monochrome and up until the final act, all colors in the past. This is a much more layman's way of telling the story in a non-linear fashion, however still keeping a sense of mystery and complexness. And just like he does so in the opening scene of The Prestige and Inception, as well as following, he uses sudden cuts to take us through long distances in time, a technique very much used by filmmakers like Malik and Goddard in the past. It seems like a majority of Nolan's works jump between long time distances with the use of jump cuts. This might have been a result created by DIY beginnings, but as he eventually became a bit more ambitious with his films, he still retained the simplistic technique that holds significant weight. He's obsessed with getting into the character's mindset. At some point in the Nolan film, one or even several of his characters will be thrust into a scene of confusion. Okay, so what am I doing? Oh, I'm chasing this guy. No, he's chasing me. Many of his protagonists suffer from a form of mental handicap. Lennon has amnesia and memento, Dormer suffers from insomnia and insomnia, and Cobb has a problem with his past memories. Nolan will often bring us closer into the character's mindsets by using a variety of tricks. For instance, he'll use a 75mm lens for the scene in Insomnia. This is so we get the sense of panic that Dorma is going through. When many filmmakers are trying to get far away from the action, he's trying to get closer and deeper to it. She wouldn't stop laughing. Deeper might mean doing this, placing an insert cut at sudden moments. These quick brief flashes of information can serve to be visual reminders of characters' wants, needs and even hopes. Look across the tables and I'll see you there. With wife, maybe a, a couple of kids. And what about hands? 
hands and objects play a wide role in all of Nolan's films, but they're used in a way that makes the stories reflective of his character's needs. By showing us an object in someone's hands, you're informing the viewer of what's emotionally at stake, whether it's crucial evidence or an important cog in a machine. This can also save time setting up wides and masters for exposition. Nolan explains why he often focuses on hands and objects here. The use of inserts in, in the film is quite noticeable. It's something I've maintained in all my films. There's a couple different reasons for it. There is a there is a form of narrative connection that's made through objects in the film and drawing attention to the, the objects. Connections between scenes as they appear in the film are based purely on those objects, you know, the earring or the hammer or the seahorse or these things, rather than time. And so it became a way of visually linking things. To further add, even in the rare instance that he uses an opening credit sequence, Nolan will utilize it to show close-ups of objects. Not only does this set mystery, but can also be informing piece of information for a future scene, like this shot from The Prestige, foreshadowing the idea of doppelgangers and clones, which plays a major part in the film's final twist. Now that we've talked about time and close-ups, let's look at one other thing that he's widely known for. And that's making his films capacious. Say what again? Capacious. Like Howard Hawks, John Ford and David Lean, Christopher Nolan likes to utilize the tools he has at his disposal and likes to fill the frame with information, wide information. Because it's not just about the story, it's how the story is told and where the story can be set, whether it's Gotham City and trying to take us into that world, or something like the prestige where mythicism and magic combine, or dreams as a reality and inception. So whether it's placing them at the center of the frame, or making the camera a tracking bird's eye, or just pulling in a tight corridor, it adds life to the scenes, it adds gravity. And whilst filmmakers like Michael Bay use scale for wonder and entertainment value, Nolan uses it for exploration, to educate and inform us of our surroundings. He always comes back to this, the actors, the performances, the people, the audience sees first. Nolan will never waste his talent, he's always going to give them roles that are emotionally engaging. That way his mediums and close-ups are as effective alone as say a massive wide shot of Gotham City. Just look at this scene from Insomnia. Yes, what's wrong with that? No, nothing wrong. I'm just trying to figure out what kind of mentor you were. I gave her things she couldn't have. You just want to fuck her. Son of a bitch! Because performances scale, the human face can tell more to a story than a wide shot filled with explosions and grand landscapes. However, when these shots are combined with editing techniques that take us across periods, close-ups and fragmented imagery, you could be making something truly immersive. In a career just spanning 15 years, Nolan has done this very well and kept on finding new ways to challenge the audience mentally without dropping the ball. In many ways, he is today's great filmmaking magician. By weaving emotion, concepts, mystery and philosophy in his narratives, and yet on a large commercial level, he is one of the more interesting filmmakers working today. Though he has left many audiences divided in some instances. If you feel like you don't like him, that's fair enough. But perhaps you just need to go back and pay attention to some things you might have missed. Because really, it's all about the finer details.